Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. In the passage which was just read for us, we see that God is telling mankind through the Apostle Peter to be holy. Now Peter in that passage quotes from the Old Testament, one of the passages, um, where God tells the children of Israel, specifically his priests, to be holy, is in Leviticus 11 and verse 44. But on numerous different occasions in the giving of the law, God told his children to be holy uh, as he was holy. Now, Peter quotes that passage and applies it to Christians and tells us that we need to be holy. So God demands that we be holy. What does it mean for us to be holy and how can we go about obeying that command to be holy individuals? That's what I want to think about this morning. First of all, I want to ask the question, what does it mean to be holy? And I want to answer that question. When you look at the Greek word that is translated holy, the Greek word for holy is the word hagios uh, in the Greek. And it simply means this, if you look it up, it means sacred, pure, morally blameless, ceremonially consecrated. Okay, God, of course, is holy to a degree that you and I can never attain. When we think about purity, when we think about morally being blameless, certainly God is far above anything that we could ever attempt to attain in, sin, in terms of holiness. He is totally and completely pure and blameless. In 1 John 1 and verse 5, John writes, This is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So God sets this standard out there for us and says, you be holy as I am holy. Now we know, of course, that we can never be as holy as God, but nevertheless, he needs to be our example. He needs to be our benchmark, that for which we aim and that for which we strive. Now, in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, I want to read this because here we see a couple different uses of this word hagios. Paul writes to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now in that verse, the word hagios is actually used two different times, but in different forms. First of all, the word that's translated saints is hagios. Uh, in the Greek, when hagios is used just as a noun or to talk about people, it is often translated as saints. And, and what is a saint? It's a holy person, someone who is holy, someone who is pure, morally blameless, consecrated, set apart. We're going to talk about those things a little bit. But also there in this passage, the word sanctified comes from the same root word, hagios. The Greek word is actually hagiadzo, but that's the verb form. And therefore it means the process by which one has been set apart, made pure uh, morally. And we're going to talk about that in our next point. So what God commands us is to be holy. He's telling us to be pure. He's telling us to be blameless. And he's telling us to be set apart. That's what that word consecrated means. It means set apart. Set apart from what? Well, we're going to see he means set apart from the world and from uh, all of those among whom we live. We ought to be set apart for a divine or a holy purpose. So now let's answer the question. We know what holiness is. It means to be pure. It means to be without blemish. It means to be morally blameless. How do we become holy? We are, we are creatures who have sin in our lives. And uh, we are spotted and blemished by sin. In order for us to be saints, which is a holy person, we must first be sanctified. In order for us to be saints, we must first be sanctified. Again, the word sanctify is the verb form of the word holy. 
And so, in order, I'm going to make up a word here. In order to be sanctified, we need to be sanctified, okay? If I want to be a saint, then I have to be sanctified or set apart for a holy purpose by God. And, and that's what sanctified means. It means to be set apart. When we look back at the Old Testament, uh, and again, which, again, Peter quotes from when he says, Be holy, for I am holy. In order for a priest to be sanctified, to set apart for his service to the Lord, there were some things that he had to do. There was really an elaborate ceremony. If you look at Exodus 29, there, the whole chapter deals with different things that were to be done to um, a priest before they could actually serve in the tabernacle and, and, and perform the services that the Lord had set apart for them to do. But involved in all of that, we're not going to read the whole chapter, there needed to be a sacrifice. And the priest's blood was to be put upon the priest after that sacrifice had been made. And there was more than one sacrifice that had to be made during this uh, ceremony. Also, the priest needed to be washed before they could enter into their service. And we also know that that washing was a, even after they were initially sanctified or made holy, that washing was a continual thing that had to be done each time before they could enter into the tabernacle in service to the Lord. And finally, they also had to be wearing their priestly garments. They had to be wearing the right clothing. They were given specific clothing, which God had described uh, to Moses before they could serve uh, in the tabernacle to the Lord. So that, you know, that is really a foreshadow in my mind of how we are sanctified today. There's a sacrifice. There's a washing that takes place. There's a garments that need to be worn how are we sanctified? Well, if you look in the New Testament, we'll see that there are a lot of passages that talk about sanctification. In his prayer in John 17 and verse 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth when he was praying to the Father. And so we're sanctified by the truth or by the word. Uh, we are sanctified according to Jesus in his prayer. You see, it's in the word that we learn about the death of Jesus. And we know that the death of Jesus is also a requirement for our sanctification. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10, we read, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. How are we sanctified? Through the body of Jesus Christ, meaning the sacrifice of his body on the cross. Drop down to verse 29 there in Hebrews 10. The Hebrew writer says, Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? Now notice there that the Hebrew writer says that it was the blood of Jesus uh, that sanctified us. And, and set us apart. And so in order for us to be sanctified, there needed to be a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they used animals. Here in the better covenant, under Christ, there was a sacrifice. And it was Jesus himself, the Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God, without blemish and without spot. Well, you know, you could look at it in one way and say, okay, that's God's part. Okay, he's given us his word that tells us how to be sanctified. He sent Jesus to die on the cross to make it possible through his blood for us to be sanctified. But what's required of us to be sanctified? Well, several things, but really it just boils down to obedience to the will of God. By faith in Jesus we're sanctified. In Acts 26 and 18, here we read, this is when Jesus is actually talking to Paul and giving him his, his mission statement, if you will. He says that he was to go to the Gentiles to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness into light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So we are sanctified by faith in Jesus. Okay, but we understand that faith in Jesus it implies more than simply acknowledging Him as Savior. Acknowledging that He is the Son of God. Because we know, of course, that the Bible teaches that faith without works is dead. It does no good. And that even the demons believe in the deity of Jesus. 
in the existence of Jesus. So faith implies faithful obedience uh, to the will of Christ. We are sanctified by getting into Christ or being in Christ. Again, looking back to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, Paul said to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. We are sanctified, made holy, made pure, when we are in Christ Jesus. Now we ask ourselves the important question, what do I need to do to get into that state? What do I need to do to get into Christ so that I might become holy or sanctified, which is what God wants and demands that I do? Well, the question really comes down to then, the question, what brings me into contact with the blood of Jesus that washes away my sins? Revelation 1.5. That's not in your outline, but Revelation 1.5 says it's the blood of Jesus that washes us from our sins. Therefore, it's the blood of Jesus that sanctifies us. How do I come into contact with that blood? Well, Acts 22 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul was told how he could wash his sins away. Paul at this time in this passage was a penitent believer. He believed in Jesus. He had seen him on the road to Damascus. He had experienced sorrow and a desire to repent and do what was right and obey the Lord. And he is told by Ananias, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You've heard me preach on this many times, but he wasn't saved at the point of belief. He wasn't saved at the point of repentance. He wasn't saved by those prayers he had been praying for three days, if you read the account of his conversion. His sins were washed away when he submitted to the command to be baptized. And it was at that point that his sins were washed away. So how do we come into contact with the blood of Jesus that sanctifies us? Through baptism, which is faithful obedience to the commands of of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, Paul writes, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. You ask, how, in what sense does the Spirit baptize us? Well, the Spirit is the, is the one who gives us the Word. And it's the word that sanctifies us. It's the word that tells us to be baptized. And so when we are baptized, in a sense, the spirit is baptizing us. And when he baptizes us, when we are baptized, we are putting, being put into one body, which is, if you know your scriptures, the body is the church of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11, <clears throat> here we read, Paul talking to the Corinthians, such were some of you. He's talking about the fact some of you were horrible sinners. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. How, how did the Spirit justify them? How did the Spirit sanctify them? He did it through the Word. <coughs> That he had given through the apostles. By being put into Christ. By being baptized into Christ. We put on the priestly garments. Remember that was another one of the um, requirements. For the Old Testament priests. That they wear the priestly garments. Well we're told in Galatians 3 and verse 27. That when we are baptized. We put on Christ. For as many of you who have been, were baptized into Christ. Have put on Christ. We're putting on Christ as if, we're, as if he's a garment. We're putting on Christ. He is our garment that we wear. And we become part of this new priesthood that uh, God established through Christ. Peter describes that in 2 Peter 2 and verse 5 when he's talking to Christians. He says, you as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. What is our job as a holy priesthood? To offer up spiritual sacrifices. How do we do that? We're doing it today. We're doing it in worship. We offer up our worship to God in song and prayer and study uh, of His Word. 
acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The only way that we could be acceptable to God is through Jesus and the washing power of his blood. And we come into contact with that when we are baptized. So as Christians, we are saints. <clears throat> Again, we know that the world has, has sort of modified that, that um, definition of the word saint, and, and some, some religions have added certain requirements for somebody to be declared to be a saint. But in, in biblical sense, anyone who's been washed, been sanctified, has, is a saint. And we also are God's priesthood today, offering up spiritual sacrifices to Him. When we get into Christ, when we are baptized into Christ, really what we're doing is we're stepping out of the world. And we're setting ourselves apart and in going, in, in going into Christ, into His body. In 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18, here Paul writes, and he's quoting from the Old Testament again, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. That's sanctification right there. Be sanctified, be set apart, be separate, says the Lord. <laughs> Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. If we're going to be pure, if we're going to be holy, we shouldn't touch that which is unclean. We need to remain pure. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And so initially, how are we sanctified? How, how is it that we're set apart and made holy in God's eyes by the blood of Jesus? By his word, by my faith and obedience to the commands of Jesus, when I am baptized, his blood washes me and makes me clean, makes me a saint, makes me a priest unto God to offer up spiritual sacrifices to him. So that's how we become holy. But how do we stay holy? Now, here in our passage, which was read for us in 1 Peter 1, Peter is writing to a group of sanctified people. These people have already obeyed the gospel, but yet Peter encourages them to stay holy. In 1 Peter 1, there, verses 14 to 16, he says, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. So he's writing to people who presumably are holy. They're already sanctified and in Christ, but he's saying you continue to live in such a way that you remain holy, that you remain pure and blameless. Conforming to the former lust is what causes the Christian to become defiled and unholy. It is possible for me as a holy individual who has been sanctified by the blood of Jesus to conform to my former lusts or go back into the world, if you will, and get mixed up in all of those things that defile or sin and become unholy. And it's, it's sin that defiles us. Remember in James 1 and verse 27, when James gives us a, a definition of pure and undefiled religion, undefiled, that's holy, isn't it? Undefiled, he says that part of it is to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, but he also says it's to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And again, what does it mean to be unspotted from the world? He means you, you stay away from sin. You stay away from those, those actions, those thoughts that cause you to sin, to be defiled. Um, you, you need to maintain your purity. Over in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, Peter um, describes people who have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ there in verse 20. But then he says, if they are again entangled in them, entangled in what? Well, looking at the verse, he's talking about the pollutions of the world. If they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Peter says again that it's sin. It's the pollution of the world that will cause a Christian to lose his holy status before God and become defiled once again. The latter end is worse than the beginning. Is it possible for me to lose my status as a saint, as a sanctified individual? Yes. If I go back into the world and, and am overcome by the pollutions of the world, then I can lose my salvation. 
So how do we go about then? What are some, some areas, some common, some common teachings in the scripture about holiness and staying pure uh, that, that we need to consider? And, and this is, uh, we're going to talk about uh, four of these and then we'll conclude our lesson. Number one, as saints, we are to stay pure in heart. And when I say pure, I'm talking about holy. Because holiness is pure blamelessness. We are to stay pure in heart and we, we must maintain the proper motivation for that which we do. Okay. Paul in Romans 6 and 17 writing to the, to the Romans he says, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. There were no uh, ulterior motives in the Romans when they obeyed the gospel. They didn't obey the gospel for material gain. They didn't obey the gospel um, to uh, please man, if you will. They obeyed the gospel from the heart. They truly believed the things that they were taught. And therefore they obeyed, even knowing that in doing so, they could be putting their lives at risk. In Philippians 2, 3 and 4, Paul says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each of you, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. To be pure in heart means to work with the right motivation. And, and, and in this passage, Paul's saying, don't you, don't you be self-seeking. Don't you just be concerned about yourself. You esteem others better than yourself. And don't you just look out for yourself, but you look out for others as well. And so we need to remain pure in heart. Our motivation for being a Christian needs to stay pure. We need to also stay pure in thought. Saints need to stay pure in thought. That's where sin starts, right? It starts up here. And if we allow our mind to dwell on sinful things, then those thoughts eventually will be manifest in our actions, uh, in our deeds. And there are numerous passages in Matthew 5 where Jesus points this out. But in verses 27 and 28, he points out, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What's he saying there? He's saying you can sin in your mind and by the thoughts that are in your mind if you allow yourself to dwell on a, a sinful thought. And again, you know... <clears throat> We're human. We often can't control the thoughts that might come into our mind and things that might uh, pop into our brain, but certainly we can control if we continue to dwell on that. We can have enough self-discipline to say, no, I shouldn't be thinking about that and, and change the topic. Think about something else. Um, Philippians 4 and verse 8, Paul tells us the things that we should be filling our mind with. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So whether then, rather than, you know, fill our minds with thoughts of sin, sinful things, he says, you fill your mind with these things, things that are pure, things that are lovely, of good report, of good virtue. And so there's what's supposed to be occupying our mind. And we need to stay pure in thought. You know, there's only so much garbage that we can allow into our brain, but again, before it starts affecting the way that we behave. Whether we're talking about the music that we listen to, the things we watch on television, the things we may see on the internet. Um, when we allow our mind to dwell on sinful things, then we're... we're Number one, we're sinning uh, mentally, but on, on the other hand, it's also eventually going to manifest itself uh, in our actions. So we're to remain pure in thought. We're to remain pure in heart. Also, we're to remain pure in deed. Pure in deed. We're to be holy in our conduct. Verse 14 of our text, 1 Peter 1. He says, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. Uh, our conduct needs to be holy. It needs to, we need to conduct ourselves in such a way that we are set apart, that we are separate from the world. 
Those with whom we come into contact on a daily basis, whether it's a co-worker or a student, co-students, fellow students, um, whatever it might be, you know, they ought to know that you're a Christian without you telling them a single word because of the way that you behave yourself. Um, if we look at, for example, James 4 and verse 8, James says, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Again, purify your hearts. We already talked about having a pure heart, pure motives. But cleanse your hands, you sinners. In other words, James is saying, clean up your act. Okay, you, you have a pure heart, now you have pure hands or clean hands. Don't be involved in things that are sinful. And I would add that, you know, included in this with our idea of staying pure indeed, that includes sexual purity. Um, we are warned over and over again about sexual purity and remaining pure. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by um, abstaining from sex until we are in a married relationship that is pleasing to God. In 1 Thessalonians 4 3 through 4, Paul says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. God wants us to be sanctified. And then Paul says that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That's a big thing that will cause us to be defiled. Each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. And so in, in, our, in, in, a, in our lives, in a sexual way, we need to remain pure. Uh, and by the way, that one I don't think is in your outline. I see some of you looking around for it. Um, also, uh, what we could also talk about our speech. And our speech uh, needs to remain uh, pure. In Ephesians 4 and verse 25, Paul says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each of one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then Colossians 4 and verse 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And so in our actions, we're to remain pure. Follow and obey the will of God. In our words, we're to remain pure. Our words need to be good and holy. Can people tell by the way you speak that you're a Christian? Can people tell by the words you do not use that you are a Christian? Can people tell by the way that you act? You know, one time I heard an individual who, he was saying this actually in a negative way. Um, he, was, there were, he was looking at a family in the church and uh, at that family and their children and he said, those kids are just carbon copies of the parents. And he meant that in a bad way. But I thought, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Those, those parents were faithful Christians. And isn't that the job of us as parents to impart that to our children to be faithful? Um, whether we're young teenagers or, or whether we're old, we need to be set apart. We shouldn't talk like the world. We shouldn't, I should have included this one, we shouldn't dress like the world. You know, the weather's getting warmer and the clothes are coming off. I live on a college campus, and I see that. Let's dress modestly. Let's dress like Christians. Uh, so whether we're talking about speech or in sexual matters or we're talking about other deeds, we need to remain pure. If you are a Christian, you've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. You've been made holy. Now stay that way. Act that way. And by doing that, you'll save yourself and also... You'll be a good influence on others, and maybe you can bring others to Christ as well. As we conclude the lesson then this morning, if there are any here who have not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we want you to know that uh, God wants you to be sanctified. He wants you to be washed and cleansed from your sins. Maybe you already believe. Maybe you try to do that which is right. But please understand that belief or good deeds do not wash away sins. It is the blood of Jesus that does that. And friend, if you've not yet been baptized, your sins have not been washed away. We encourage you, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you're willing to repent of the sin in your life and confess your faith in Him, be baptized this morning and be put into the church, uh, into the body of Christ where there is sanctification and where there is the hope of heaven. Many of us, most of us have done that. 
Perhaps, though, you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, I'm one of those sanctified people who's gone back into the world. I've allowed sin to creep back into my life. I'm no longer living a pure and morally blameless life. Uh, and, and I need to be restored to a right relationship with God. God says if that's the case, you need to repent of your sins and ask His forgiveness. We see an example of that in Acts chapter 8 with Simon who had fallen away. If you've, no, if you've never obeyed the gospel, we offer you the opportunity to do that. If you need to be restored to a right relationship with God, we encourage you to do that as we stand and as we sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.